In our previous video, we spoke about cell signaling. Cell signaling is the way in which cells communicate with the outside world. This can mean communicating with other cells in a particular organism or simply sensing changes in the environmental conditions. This is typically going to occur through the interaction of receptor proteins on the surface of that cell, which will then initiate a change in the cell that has received that signal. What we're going to talk about today is the second half of this equation. How then does a cell upon receiving a signal initiate a change in its behavior? This process is referred to as signal transduction, and that's what we're talking about today. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Cell signaling is the way in which cells communicate with each other. Typically, one cell initiates the signal, and then another cell receives that signal and it alters its behavior accordingly. What we're going to talk about today is the second part of that process, the part that happens after a cell receives a signal, and that process is called signal transduction. Signal transduction is the mechanism by which a receptor, upon binding a signal, then relays the fact that it has bound that signal to the cell and initiates a cellular response. Now, typically, this is going to require changes in gene expression. And if we're talking about a eukaryotic cell, somehow that receptor, which is commonly at the surface of the cell in the plasma membrane, needs to relay that signal to the nucleus, which is where the genes are located and where gene expression is regulated by a host of different proteins. Now, to start this process, we're going to start at the basics. We'll start by talking about receptors and ligands. So when we talked about cell signaling, we talked about the fact that cells can send various types of signals from, each, uh, from one to another. This can occur through several different mechanisms, such as paracrine signaling or endocrine signaling, but there are many different types of signals that a cell can send. Cell signaling can be accomplished through the use of small proteins or ions or other types of, of biomolecules. Whatever the type of bio biomolecule it is that actually is the signal, we refer to, when we talk about signal transduction, as a ligand. A ligand is anything that a receptor binds to in its binding pocket. You can think about it this way. Anything that an enzyme works on is referred to as its substrate. Anything that a receptor interacts with is referred to as its ligand. Now, there are many different types of ligands, as I just described. The majority of ligands that you will encounter in a biological system are going to be hydrophilic or bulky. And what that means is that a hydrophilic or a bulky residue is not going to be able to cross the plasma membrane. They will interact with a type of receptor called a cell surface or an extracellular receptor. Cell surface receptors are integral membrane proteins or sometimes protein complexes in quaternary structure, multiple proteins interacting with each other, that reside in the plasma membrane and they'll have three parts. They'll have a cytoplasmic part, they'll have a transmembrane domain, and they'll have an extracellular binding domain. All three of these parts are necessary for that receptor to be able to receive the signal, the ligand, on the extracellular side of the cell, transduce that signal through the plasma membrane via the transmembrane domain, and then cause some type of conformational change in the intracellular or cytoplasmic domain that will alert the cell that some binding has happened or that a receptor has now bound to its ligand. If a ligand is small enough and hydrophobic enough, it will be able to cross the plasma membrane. In this case, it may interact with a type of receptor called an intracellular receptor. Very commonly, intracellular receptors have a binding pocket that will allow it to interact with its ligand, and then upon binding its ligand, it will change its conformation and activate a DNA binding domain, a domain that allows it to bind to and regulate the expression of various genes. A very important class of these intracellular receptors are called transcription factors in eukaryotes. And transcription factors, uh, and we'll talk about this more in a later video, transcription factors have the ability to bind to what are called promoter regions upstream of genes and encourage or discourage the expression of those genes and thus eventually the production of the proteins in which they encode. Now, one of the things that we'll see later on in this video is that extracell extracellular receptors or cell surface receptors, once they get activated, they're going to initiate a long 
pathway of a response that will eventually converge on a transcription factor as well for the most part. Because the bottom line is whether that particular ligand is, is going to cross the plasma membrane and interact with an intracellular receptor or be detected by a cell surface receptor, we are eventually going to need to alter gene expression if we're going to alter the behavior of a cell. So let's start with the cell surface receptors. As I said, all cell surface receptors are going to have three components. They're going to have an extracellular binding domain, which is what the part of the protein that will interact with its given ligand. And remember that receptors are incredibly specific. All proteins have a unique three-dimensional structure, and that is what's going to dictate which signals a given receptor is able to interact with. What's neat about these is every cell has an entire suite of cell surface receptors that it possesses. And because each cell has a unique set of cell surface receptors, they can actually be used as markers to tell us what type of cell we're dealing with. So for example, if we're talking about a helper T cell, only helper T cells have a type of cell surface receptor called a CD4 receptor. So if you see a CD4 receptor on the surface of a cell, you can be pretty confident that it's a helper T cell. On the other hand, killer T cells have a CD8 receptor at their cell surface, and that will tell you that that particular cell is a killer T cell. Now, as I said, all extracellular or cell surface receptors are going to have an extracellular ligand binding domain that allows it to interact with its given signal or signals that it's allowed to detect. Attached to that is going to be another part of the protein called the transmembrane domain. The transmembrane domain is the part that's going to traffic across the plasma membrane that will be then attached on the inside to the, the third part of the, the receptor called the cytoplasmic or intracellular domain. And that particular intracellular domain is what typically going to undergo some type of confirmation change to alert co other components inside of the cell that a ligand has been bound to the receptor and initiate what we call a signal transduction cascade or a signal cascade. A big thing to remember about ligands that interact with cell surface receptors is very commonly the ligand itself will never actually enter the cell that's receiving a signal. There are three major types of cell surface receptors that we encounter. The first one is called an ion-linked cell the receptor. And an ion-linked receptor is a receptor that upon binding will undergo a conformational change that will allow ions to either enter the cell or to exit the cell. And this entrance or exit of certain ions will cause a response in the cell's behavior. Another type of cell surface receptor is called a G-protein coupled receptor. G-protein coupled receptors or GPCRs are a receptor that's inside the plasma membrane, but attached to its cytoplasmic domain inside of the cell is a collection of proteins called G proteins. Now, G proteins are trimeric. There are three subunits that are all collectively uh, stuck together, but upon binding of the GPCR, a conformational change happens with this trimeric protein, and two of the subunits, called the beta-gamma subunits, are going to separate from the alpha subunit, which remains in contact with the cytoplasmic domain of the receptor. G protein coupled receptors are incredibly important in human health and disease, so much so that about 50% of all pharmaceutic pharmaceuticals target some type of GPCR. Moreover, pathogenic bacteria such as cholera and botulism produce toxins that actually uh, interfere with the activity of GPCRs and cause disease in that mechanism. The last type of receptor we commonly see is an, is an enzyme-linked receptor. Enzyme link receptors are interesting. In the cytoplasmic domain, the way they undergo a conformational change is typically by performing some type of enzymatic activity. Many times these are referred to as kinases, and as we'll learn, a kinase is an enzyme that phosphorylates something else. It adds a phosphate group to something. A very common class of enzyme re link receptors are called tyrosine kinase receptors, and they typically exist as dimers. And upon binding, they go from being two separate proteins to being connected to each other and they end up forming a dimer, or two proteins interacting with each other. The cytoplasmic domain of each of these dimeric proteins will then phosphorylate the other that causes a conformational change which allows it to associate with other proteins and then transduce the, cell, the signal into the cell that that receptor has been activated. So again, the three major classes of cell surface receptors are ion-linked, ion-channel-linked receptors, G-protein-coupled receptors, and enzyme-linked receptors. So as I mentioned before, not all signals are received outside the plasma membrane by cell surface receptors. Small hydrophobic ligands, 
things like vitamin D and some steroid hormones are actually hydrophobic enough and small enough to actually make it across the plasma membrane. In this case, they can interact with receptors that exist in the cytoplasm called intracellular receptors. As I described before, upon binding their ligand, the conformational change in that in that intracellular receptor will reveal a DNA binding domain, which will allow it to go into the nucleus and interact with the DNA and influence gene expression in that manner. However, intracellular receptors, in particular transcription factors, often lie in what we refer to in signal transduction terms downstream of many other signaling cascades. When we talk about signaling cascades or signaling pathways, we tend to think of them in linear order, with the first step being the binding of a receptor to a ligand and then signaling from one protein to the next uh, or one second messenger to the next until it converges on a final activation of a transcription factor. Things that happen first in a signal transduction pathway, also known as a signaling cascade, are referred to as occurring upstream. Things that occur later are referred to as occurring downstream. And very often, intracellular receptors or transcription factors are the most downstream step in any signaling pathway. Because as I described before, in the end, no matter what we're doing, if we want the cell to change its behavior in some stereotypical way, more than likely we're going to need to alter what genes are being expressed. Let's go back out to the plasma membrane and talk about our cell surface receptors again. So the first step in signal transduction is the binding of a ligand to a receptor and its activation followed by a conformational change. What happens afterwards? What's the next step? And the next step is the activation of a signaling pathway. Now, signaling pathways typically function uh, through the activity of activated proteins or second messengers or the release of ions. So let's look at an example of how this actually occurs. Let's use a, a ligand called EGF, epidermal growth factor, and its signal transduction pathway as an example. So EGF binds to the EGF receptor, or EGFR, in the plasma membrane of its target cells. EGFR is a receptor tyrosine kinase, and a receptor tyrosine kinase exists as two separate proteins, and in the cytoplasmic domain, the tails of these receptors will actually come together to form a dimer and phosphorylate each other. Remember, they're kinases, and kinases are enzymes that phosphorylate other compounds or proteins. Once those cytoplasmic domains of the EGFR have been phosphorylated, they're now able to interact with two other proteins, GRB2 and SOS. Those two proteins are then able to activate a protein called RAS, and RAS in turn activates a protein called RAF. Now RAF is a kinase, so kinases do what kinases do, and they phosphorylate things. And one of the proteins that RAF is able to phosphorylate is a protein called MEC. Now the K in MEC actually stands for kinase, and because MEC is a kinase, it's going to phosphorylate other proteins. And one of the proteins it phosphorylates and activates is a protein called ERK. ERK itself is also a kinase, but once ERK has been activated by phosphorylation, ERK is actually going to go into the nucleus, interact with a host of transcription factors, and those transcription factors have roles in promoting cell proliferation, cell growth, and angiogenesis, or the, uh, the creation of new blood vessels. On the other hand, those transcription factors have the activity of blocking a process called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. In other words, this is a cell survival and growth signal. What you see in this pathway is common of many other pathways. Typically, activation of proteins is going to occur through the activity of kinases, or phosphatases. Phosphatases are simply enzymes that oppose the activity of a kinase and remove a phosphate group from something. But we have to be very careful about phosphorylation. We quite often fall into the trap of thinking that phosphorylation is actually always something that activates a protein, and that's not true. Sometimes, phosphorylation can be inhibitory. Uh, the activity of a kinase could act to inactivate a protein. And then, in that case, the opposing action of a phosphatase could activate that. Typically, phosphorylation is going to occur on specific amino acids in a given protein. Most commonly, those amino acids are either going to be tyrosine, serine, or threonine, which are available to have a phosphate group added to them. What's really interesting is, depending on what protein it is and which amino acids are phosphorylated, depends on the activation status of that protein. In some proteins, it's even more confusing. It's neither as simple as phosphorylation is activation and dephosphorylation is inactivation. In some proteins, if you add a phosphate group to uh, this given amino acid, it's, it's activating, it activates that protein. If you then subsequently add a phosphate to another amino acid, that can act to inhibit the activity of that protein. So in that case, phosphorylation can be both uh, activating and inhibitory depending on which amino acid you are phosphorylating. 
What I'm trying to get across to you is that cell signaling can actually be quite confusing. And we tend to think of cell signaling pathways as these clean linear pathways, starting with a receptor and, and flowing through a series of proteins or second messengers until we end up activating or inactivating some type of transcription factor and in influencing gene expression. In reality, it's typically a lot messier than that. Furthermore, the activation or inactivation of proteins by adding a phosphate group, for example, is not the only way in which signals can be tr transduced. Very commonly, other molecules or ions called second messengers are involved. Now, there are several great examples of second messengers. Uh, we'll look at a few today. One, of, uh, one type of second messenger that's very commonly used in cells is something called cyclic AMP. So if you remember, AMP, adenosine monophosphate, is what happens when you have an ATP, but you lose two phosphates from it. What happens uh, very commonly in cells uh, in, certain, in certain conditions, for example, cells that are experiencing low energy status, some ATP, will interact with an enzyme called adenyl cyclase. And adenyl cyclase will convert that ATP, remove two of its phosphates, and convert it into cyclic AMP. Now, cyclic AMP most commonly interacts with an enzyme called PKA, or protein kinase A. Protein kinase A is, of course, a kinase, which adds phosphate groups to things to influence their activity. PKA has a host of different, a host of different uh, target proteins that it interacts with, and in doing so, can influence a, a, a broad range of of cellular behaviors another great example of a second messenger is calcium calcium might be the most common second messenger frequently used in in all uh, in cells now what happens with this is calcium is typically uh free, is, is regularly pumped out of the cell when it comes in or pumped into the smooth endoplasmic reticulum so the end result is you typically have a smooth endoplasmic reticulum with a very high calcium concentration but uh, a, a cytoplasm that has very low calcium concentration. Well, what can happen in response to certain cellular signals is calcium can be released from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, flood the cytoplasm, bind to various proteins that then trigger a response. Alternatively, calcium can be allowed in from the extracellular side of the membrane, which can have the same effect. Now, what typically happens is calcium goes about its business, interacts with a host of different proteins, or I should say proteins interact with it since calcium is just an ion that will alter their behavior, they will uh, do their business, and then the calcium will be rapidly pumped out of the cytoplasm, uh, either back into the smooth ER or out into the extracellular space. The effect that calcium has on a cell depends on the conditions of the cell and what type of cell it is. So for example, calcium release inside a pancreatic beta cell stimulates the release of insulin, whereas calcium release inside of a, of a, of a muscle cell stimulates contraction. So again, it is cell specific and condition specific. Another very common group of second messengers are inositol phospholipids. The most common one is phosphatidyl inositol, abbreviated PI. Uh, phosphatidyl inositol can be phosphorylated to form phosphatidyl inositol phosphate, or PIP, or phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate, PIP2. Uh, uh, PIP and PIP2 then can be acted upon uh, by uh, phospholipase. So phospholipase can cleave PIP2 into two different molecules, diacylglycerol or DAG, uh, which remains in the membrane and interacts with uh, protein kinase C, which is a kinase that has a host of different, uh, different target proteins that it will phosphorylate and activate or inactivate. And IP3 uh, typically goes to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum where it interacts with IP3 receptors that then trigger the release of calcium. And we talked already about calcium as a second messenger. So quite often, calcium as a second messenger actually gets activated downstream of the inositol phospholipids uh, being activated and activating other proteins. The big thing to remember is this, no matter how that signal is transduced, whether it's by the activity of kinases or through the activity of second messengers, once that receptor has bound its ligand and become activated, it needs to relay a signal through these signal transduction pathways and almost exclusively going to converge at some point on a transcription factor or a group of transcription factors, which in the end are able to bind to and alter the expression of genes through the process of transcription. The final and necessary step for all signal transduction pathways is terminating the signal. You don't want all signal transduction pathways operating all the time in your cell. So when the signal has gone or the behavior needs to be stopped, there needs to be a way of terminating the signal. Quite often, it's just a matter of sort of undoing what you've done. So if you've activated a bunch of proteins through the activity of kinases, then you need to inactivate them through the activity of phosphatases. 
or you can use an enzyme like phosphodiesterase, for example. So if cyclic AMP was the second messenger used to activate a bunch of proteins, well, you use uh, phosphodiesterase, which can then go around and break uh, cyclic AMP back into regular AMP, which will relieve its activatory behavior. Calcium ions are another good example. How do you remedy this? Well, quite simply, you lower the calcium concentration. You either load that calcium back into the smoothie R, or you just pump it completely out of the cell, and that terminates the signal. Now, what are the very common effects of cell signaling or signal transduction? Well, there are lots of different things a cell can do in response to uh, a given signal. One of the most common ones is altering its metabolism. So remember, cells are always trying to decide whether or not they should be doing biosynthesis or making things or storing energy for a later date. And in large part, this is going to be dictated upon by what's going on outside of the cell. A great example of this occurs when your body releases adrenaline. So you may know adrenaline or epinephrine, as it's also known, as, uh, as a, a hormone that is released by the adrenal glands and typically triggers what we call the fight or flight response. You know what it feels like when your adrenaline gets going. But remember that when your adrenaline is running high, that typically indicates that your body is going to need to do some type of energetic work. So what does adrenaline do? Well, adrenaline binds to these receptors on the surface of cells called beta adrenergic receptors. And upon binding of these beta adrenergic receptors, that triggers an increase in the production of cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP in that case is going to activate its target protein, protein kinase A or PKA. The activation of PKA causes PKA to interact with a protein called glycogen phosphorylase kinase and activates that. Glycogen phosphorylase kinase, which is itself a kinase, is going to phosphorylate a protein called glycogen phosphorylase. Activating glycogen phosphorylase then causes glycogen phosphorylase to go in and break down uh, the glycogen stores stored within that tissue, breaking them into glucose monomers. Glucose monomers can then be used as a ready source of energy to power that particular organism who's experiencing a fight or flight response. Of course, once that fight or flight response has ended and the adrenaline levels in the organism decrease, then that particular activation of that pathway then is relieved. Cyclic AMP gets cleaved back, but gets cleaved back into AMP and the cell resumes normal operations. Another thing that happens commonly downstream of receptor activation by a ligand is, is the uh, change to our cell towards growth and proliferation. We talked about a great example of this earlier on when we talked about EGF. Most growth factors are received by receptors that are receptor tyrosine kinases. They dimerize and phosphorylate each other on the cytoplasmic uh, domain of those receptors, and they can interact with proteins such as RAS and RAF, which then activate MAC and ERK and uh, trigger the cell to go about um, growing and proliferating. This is a very important thing because cells don't typically divide without receiving some type of external signal. Cells, in fact, shouldn't divide unless the conditions are appropriate. More specifically, you don't want cells dividing when they're already in contact on all sides by other cells. This would result in, if they were to do so, this would result in unchecked and uncontrolled growth, which commonly results in cancer. And indeed, when we look at proteins like RAS, RAS is a very common oncogene or a gene that can trigger the production of tumors. If RAS is too active, if we can't turn off the RAS pathway, what can happen is cells can enter an endless cycle of growth and proliferation and resist the opposing process of apoptosis, which would typically result in the death of that cell because of its inappropriate behaviors. Which brings us then to the third potential outcome of, of cell signaling. Another very common response to activation of a receptor is apoptosis. Apoptosis is the process of programmed cell death. Now you may be thinking, why would a cell want to kill itself? Well, there are several reasons. If a cell is damaged, if a cell senses that it has too many mutations in its DNA, or if a cell is superfluous, i.e. it's no longer needed. Apoptosis is very important under normal body conditions to remove cells that are damaged or potentially virally infected. But it's also important during development. Quite often during the developmental processes, our, body, our bodies look differently. And the reason why is we grow extra tissue. So for example, uh, when you were uh, still uh, when you were still a fetus, you actually your digits were connected by small stretches of skin. Well, in order to have individual digits, the cells that make up those stretches of skin that connect the digits have to undergo apoptosis to give it their final form. It's also very important in immunology. One of the things that can harm our bodies the most are viruses, and viruses get into our cells and hijack our cells and cause our cells to produce more viruses that then propagate the infection. 
How then does our body remove those virally infected cells? Well, it's simple. We have specialized cells in our body called natural killer cells and killer T cells. And natural killer cells and killer T cells actually go around to cells, look to determine whether they've been infected with a virus, and then they send si strong signals to that cell that it needs to undergo apoptosis. It needs to kill itself. Why? Well, it's simple. When a cell undergoes apoptosis, it's a programmed cell death. It essentially destroys everything that's happening inside of it and basically implodes. Why is this helpful? Well, simple. If a cell is infected with a virus, it probably contains millions or billions of different viruses that are going to be released and infect millions of other cells. So what happens if a cell undergoes apoptosis? Well, that entire cell destroys itself as well as the viruses that are contained inside, and that can help stem the propagation of the virus. The final thing I want you to keep in mind in closing out this particular video, we looked at signal transduction for a very simplistic view. We looked at mainly, a, mainly linear pathways with uh, a single receptor being activated and a single output at the end. Rarely is this the case in most biological systems. Typically, in biological systems, you're going to have complex interactions where signal transduction pathways overlap with each other, they can converge on each other, they can work in parallel. Uh, the activation of a single receptor may activate several different signal transduction pathways. Um, so what I'm trying to get across to you is that signal transduction is a very, very confusing process. In fact, many of the, uh, the tr signal transduction pathways that exist in humans, for example, we still don't know the full story of. We're still learning about them. But this is very important as well because you don't want to have single, you want to have that sort of built-in redundancy because this can prevent the cell from responding inappropriately or too strongly to a single ligand or a single change in environmental condition. This integration of signal transduction pathways actually is what allows complex life to exist. Today we talked about signal transduction. Signal transduction is the second half of a story we began in our previous video on cell signaling. Cell signaling is about the origin and delivery of a particular signal. Signal transduction is what happens when that target cell finally receives that signal. Remember that when a, when a receptor is bound by its ligand, it's going to trigger a a chain of events within the cell that will eventually impact the ability of that cell to uh, alter its gene expression and alter its behavior. Although signal transduction is necessary and important for all living things, it's also an incredibly confusing topic when we start to look at the various interactions of signal transduction pathways. I hope you guys learned a lot today and I'll talk to you guys real soon. Thanks!